Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the December New York Open Statistical Programming Meetup. Hope everyone's having a good time uh, as we start to wind down the year. Some of you may have already started winding down the year three months ago. Some of you haven't yet. But hopefully, as, as the calendar year has come to an end, I hope everyone's having a nice time and is excited for another talk. It's good to see everybody. Hope everyone's having a wonderful uh, Thursday, I believe it is. Hope everyone's enjoying their time. So first up, as we always like to do, we always like to start this meetup by asking who is hiring. Now, I know it's kind of hard to say who's hiring in here. In fact, it's impossible for anyone to get up and say it, except for myself, or our speakers, or Nicole. So if you are hiring and you'd like to hire someone from this community, go to the NYHackR Slack. It's nyhackr.slack.com. We have a link to it at nyhackr.org and go to the job postings channel and post your job there. You'll see we recently had a few postings, I think two in this past week. Um, we've gotten many people's jobs, both back when we were always in person and now that we're virtual through this Slack channel. So I hope we get more and more people jobs. It's always nice to do that. I myself am hiring, looking for many positions that aren't even on our careers website because someone has to update it and that's me. Um, but we're looking for data scientists, shiny devs, we're looking for people like Linux admin experience, looking for account executives and salespeople. Uh, so lots of positions at landeranalytics.com or message me because you know you could all find me on then my hack or Slack or Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever. Uh, so again, if you want to post a job, go to job postings at the NY Hacker Slack. As we always do, um, we have pizza. So this month's pizza came from Rocco's Pizza Joint. I'll get a nice close in shot of that. Um, you can see this is a grandma slice. It was baked in a pan. That's why it has the charring in the bottom and the little um, inverse bubbles. I wouldn't test the cheese lock on this because it's so heavy from all the crushed tomatoes that it's not going to stay up there. Um, but it's a really good place, like an under the radar place. It's like looks like a corner slice joint. And if you walk past, you might not notice how, how great it is, particularly for their grandma slices, as I have here. So if anyone else has gotten pizza or any lesser food from any other type of cuisine, let me know. Go, jump in the chat. Let me know where you got your food from or your beverages, whatever you're eating or drinking or not eating or drinking. Let us know in the chat. Hopefully you got some pizza. Um, we all know that's my uh, my favorite, absolute favorite food, uh, bordering line on obsession. But I hope you all enjoy whatever you're eating. Next month, January, we will be both in person and virtual. I want to say thank you to Brain Station for hosting us in their beautiful space down in Soho, um, where, we, where we will have Epec and Sari talking about how to analyze complex patient-generated mobile health data. So it's going to be really cool as a topic, and it'll be really nice to be both in person and virtual. The announcement will go out probably sometime next week, and we'll provide all the information. Again, if you want to attend from anywhere in the world, it will be on streamed on our YouTube channel, and you could actually chat and comment right in there or you can chat and comment on our Slack channel. And it'll also be in person, like I said, in Soho. So we look forward to kicking off the new year with this in-person meetup. For tonight, or any other night, I guess, um, when you have questions, you can put it in the Zoom chat right here, or even better, you could put it in the Slack channel. We have a channel called Monthly Meetup Chat. If you put it in there, it's a lot easier for me to collate the questions and ask them of our speaker afterwards, because I can't copy and paste from Zoom for some reason. I don't know why, but it's killing me, but I can from Slack. So join the Slack community and ask your questions in there, please. Uh, also, some people have asked, uh, we held our, our Gov conference uh, two weeks ago now, it seems like. Yeah, two weeks ago. Um, so the videos will be up in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're editing the videos right now. Actually, Nicole is doing it all. Uh, so it takes a lot of time to edit these videos. Hopefully get them up within the next two weeks for everyone to see. You can see I am wearing the t-shirt because these are conference t-shirts make up like 80% of my wardrobe at this point. I have multiple colors from multiple years of multiple conferences, so it's great. So with all those announcements, I would like to welcome and thank our speaker fresh from speaking at our gov two weeks ago. Um, we had a hole in our schedule and we asked her, can you speak like in two weeks? And she's like, sure. So we're very, very grateful and very excited to have Dania come and speak to us. Everyone, please welcome Golf Clap for Dania. The talk title is You Are an Analytics Engineer. Um, if you were at the RGov conference, you saw me and my colleague and dear friend Max Richmond give a very similar talk. Um, I actually stole half the size from that talk and I'm expanding on it here today. But in a nutshell, this is a story. 
about me, a data scientist, and my journey of discovering that I need analytics engineering. So strap in. I think this will be a fun ride. Um, so starting off, uh, hi, my name is Danya, um, Danya Morali to be exact. And I thought I would start off with a picture of just like some things about me, some words people use to describe me. Um, I have been, I was pretty active in the Our Ladies DC. I'm based in DC. Well, I'm based in the suburbs of DC now. Um, I used to be pretty active in the Our Ladies um, in DC. When the pandemic happened, I moved out to the suburbs. So I haven't been active since like early 2020. I'm sad about it. I really want to get back in, but I will forever be an Our Lady. Um, some other just job titles that I've held in the past have been statistician, quantitative analyst. Um, I dabbled in customer analytics management for a year and decided that that management maybe isn't the thing for me, but um, good experience. Jump back in into uh, being a senior data scientist. That's what I do now. Um, but on the side, I'm also a dance teacher. Um, I'm a Bollywood dance teacher. You can see this picture of me with my kids. Um, and I love doing that. And I feel like that's a pretty important facet of my personality. Um, oh, I even skipped over this. My claim to fame is I met Hadley in grad school. Um, if you know Hadley and never met him, he's really cool. Uh, his Instagram is also very fascinating. He puts a lot of, uh, baked goods on there, which is not R related, but cool guy. He's a hero. And I was really happy that I got to meet him. Um, yeah. Anyway, also a dog mom. This is my dog, uh, wife. Eh. Uh, and I also am a yeller about DEI issues in tech. Uh, if you know me professionally, you know, I spend a lot of my time at work, like talking about this uh, on the internet, elsewhere, if you want to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, any of that stuff um, in tech, uh, come talk to me. I love talking about that. But None of that is super important. What's more important is um, I think I might be able to get the title of analytics engineer. I don't know if I'm quite there yet, but I have spent this year kind of, I don't know, discovering that maybe I am um, an analytics engineer now. So let me tell you that story. So before I start there, I want to talk about what is analytics engineering. It's a pretty, it's a pretty new term. Um, like we all love our, our buzzwords. And I feel like this is one of the big buzzwords I've seen in like 2021, 2022. Um, so analytics engineering is really like the intersection of data analytics and data engineering. So data analytics, as most people are probably super familiar with, it's um, when you're using data to make sense of a business, of of, of something, um, identify patterns, develop recommendations, like you're, you're making sense of data when you're working as a data analyst. Data engineering is more on the setting up the database, maintaining the database, optimizing your database and your data for um, speed and performance. And it's sort of very focused on the data, not so much on the analysis of the data. Now, what analytics engineering does is it translates that that information from the database to being more analyst readable. So it incorporates um, business information. It optimizes the analyst's ability to like really quickly make sense of the data so that you can use it to apply to your business or whatever your application is. Um, and you do that while also optimizing for speed and performance. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get like all the good stuff from data engineering and then also all of the other analysis information that you need. Um, like I said, analytics engineering is not something that I really realized was a thing that existed. It was always like, oh, I got to clean data. Like, I don't want clean data. <laughs> um, but learning to embrace that that step of uh, the full like data science life cycle has just completely changed my life. But like, how did I get here? Is like, how did I really realize that I needed analytics engineering? So this past year. Um, this is this is a little bit of the story. Uh, so there exists this tech company. I work at it. It's called Arcadia. Um, and our uh, goal is to decarbonize the grid by giving access to community solar to all people. Um, quick aside, so what is community solar? Um, when you think of solar, you're probably thinking of rooftop solar where you put a solar panel on your roof. The issue with rooftop solar is, well, one, you need, you need a roof. You need to own your roof too. Um, super expensive. Um, your roof has to be facing the right direction. There can't be trees in the way. It's like there's, there's a lot of barriers to entry um, and you don't want to have barriers to getting access to clean energy. So 
So what Community Solar does is instead of putting it, the onus on the individual to put solar panels on their home, you group these panels together on, in these solar farms. Um, and it can be on an actual like legit farm, it can be on a whole bunch of roofs together. Uh, but basically you have developers that build these um, solar farms and then anybody that lives in the community surrounding um, that, that, that set of solar panels can get the uh, electricity that comes off of um, that farm. And then you now have access to clean power without any of the barriers to entry. Um, and we hope that Arcadia, what we do is we try and get as many people on as possible to increase the demand um, to then give developers a reason to increase the supply of community solar and then really make a difference in um, the, the state of the grid. Anyway, Moving past that. So basically, I work at this company um, and we have our business goal was we want to try and get every single person on this platform and we want them to be um, a customer for as long as possible. We want to maximize their lifetime. And so the marketing team was like, how can we identify individuals who will maximize their time with us. And if those individuals are not going to maximize their time with us because of reasons, what are those reasons and how can we change our product um, to make it more accessible? So I walked in and I was like, oh, data scientist. This sounds like a predictive analytics problem. This actually sounds like a survival analysis problem. I was like, let's do this, let's build a model. And so I told the marketing team, that I and my team could build a tool that would predict the likelihood of a customer staying, given that they convert based off a bunch of features about that individual. So demographic features, geographic features, psychographic features, any all that stuff. And so really excited. And I was like, we can build this in R. This is going to be awesome. And I quickly discovered that this was not quite as easy as I wanted and it had to do with the data. So the first thing is I needed to be able to capture um, more of this. I need to be able to capture this feature data and it didn't exist in any of our core databases. I need to go to external sources to get this data. And once I got that data, I needed to be able to store it somewhere along with all of my existing customer data. Um, and the reason I needed to combine those two things was I wanted to know what the survival looks like for existing customers and then also know what their demographic, psychographic, all those other um, points of data are. Um, I also discovered I need to update this data periodically, um, and I have to have some way of doing that. Like every time I get a new customer or a new lead, um, I need to be able to know what is their survival um, looking like and who, who these people are. And the other big thing was I needed to be able to standardize the business definition of like who even is a customer. And I needed that saved somewhere in the database. And what I mean by that is it's are you a customer if you um, went onto our website and like signed up? Are you a customer if you are already put onto a project? What if there's no projects um, available in your area? Are you a customer then? Are you not? Like this is a business decision that needs to be made. And once that business decision is made, it needs to be saved somewhere that where everyone is kind of um, accessing the same definition. Um, once I built the model, so that, that's all like pre-processing stuff. Once I built the model, I needed a place to store um, my derived predicted values and relate them back to my larger data ecosystem. So like basically put it into um, production. Um, and then I need to be able to export this to um, my marketing team in a way where they could work with it, which is like, ah, okay, how am I gonna do that? And also make sure that they get the latest version of the data. Um, and then finally, I needed to be able to document everything I did, enforce quality, um, and like maintain the entire system. And I was like, ah, how am I going to do all these things? I do not have any of these things figured out. What I realized that I was missing was I was missing the elements of a good data foundation. So a good data foundation has many steps. And there's the, the first half, which is just like getting the data through the door. That's like your generation, your storage, your orchestration, your transformation. Um, pieces. And then there's also the actual like analysis of the data and like delivering it or exporting it out to people who need to like gain those insights and use those insights. Um, and then there's also governance and discovery and like documentation. So if you group those into two things, you end up having like two sections of your data foundation. There's a concept of having good data and there's all the pieces involved with that. And then there's the concept of using data well and all the pieces associated with that. And so the question for me became, how do I do this? Like, how do I build this type of system that has both of these um, core pieces of, 
of my data. So to figure that out, I had to take a step back and think um, bigger picture. I need to think about like the data architecture evolution. And this is what like, this is when things really started opening up for me. And I really started kind of going into this field of analytics engineering. So quick background. Um, if you ever heard the term ETL or extract transform load, that is generally how you get data into a data warehouse. So a data warehouse is a highly structured um, place where any of the data that exists in like your application uh, databases, it you extract that information, you transform it into the structure that you need in your warehouse, and then you load it into your warehouse. And then from there, if you want to make any um, business decisions or understand your data, you do that like in your report or in your analysis. Like, you do that within the SQL career, within the um, R code that you're doing. Now, the issue with this is that it's it's very limiting because you have to make sure that everything is structured um, in the exact same way. And it, that doesn't always work with different types of data. Now, a data lake, it's another big buzzword, I think of 2020, 2021, 2022, um, that takes, that flips ETL and makes it ELT. So instead of extracting, transforming the data and then loading it into your warehouse, you instead extract your data, load it into your data lake, and then when you need to, you transform it. And the reason that's really useful is now you can have like various types of data all stored in the same place, all stored within your data lake, and you now have access to a bunch of things. Um, the thing that became really useful for me in this case is if you go back to the beginning when I was saying I needed to get a whole bunch of like demographic and psychographic data, none of that stuff like existed in any of our like core data bases for our company. And so I can now use third party software to um, pull in that information and then just like upload that into the data lake and save it. Um, other ways that we've used this is if you ever have like Google Sheets or Excel Sheets, just like data saved in um, CSVs, you can just ingest that directly into your uh, data lake and go, go forth and use that, which is super, super powerful. And then from there, with all of this information that exists, again, within your report and within your analysis, you can do the, um, the adding of any sort of business definitions that you might need. But I don't quite want to do that either. I want that business context to be part of my system. Um, and so that's where the concept of a lake house comes in. So a lake house is what we call the um, like the canonical sense of source of truth that contains all of the business logic and all of the complexity. Um, and so and that allows you to like build things off of that business complexity without having to like really think about it. So said in another way, um, the, the concept of who is a customer, that can be defined within your lake house. Um, and have that definition can be derived from like the data that exists within your data lake. And when you go to count how many customers there are, you can just pull directly from the concept in the lake house instead of having to define that in your query every single time you try to count customers. And so you end up having like very stable data um, and stable counts down the road. So how do you do this? And who does it? Those are the two next questions. Um, so like I said before, the analyst, you're doing the analysis of the data and reporting things back. So that's kind of the analytics space. The data engineer, that's the person that's um, maintaining your data lake, um, maintaining sort of all of those uh, EL process, extract and load processes, um, and optimizing that for storage, timing, all those things. But your analytics engineer, that is a person that takes all of that stuff in your data lake and takes all of that information they know about the business and builds your lake house, which is not, I don't know if that's a term that we use across the board. That's a term that Arcadia uses for this. Um, and so you end up with this lake house that has all of these canonical terms um, and it is agnostic to all of the input systems. It's just all of the data transformed in the way that you need it um, so that you can now pull it for your reporting. The tool that you use to do that transformation and that maintenance is dbt. 
So this is actually, this was a really long-winded way to say I'm about to give you a talk about DBT. Um, if you've never heard of DBT before, this is something that uh, is pretty, it's a pretty new technology. Uh, I actually just heard about it a year ago, and I I don't know if this is entirely true. I think it stands for data build tool. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, Joe, check me out that later. Uh, but basically, this is a company that's built this tool that allows you to build these lake houses um, and these analytic engineering layers. So now I'm going to do, you know, your BuzzFeed headline version of what DVT is. So five things to know about DVT, which is a transformation workflow. The first thing is it's implemented in Python. Uh, and in a nutshell, it basically takes the power of Python and takes the power of SQL and just sort of like mashes it together and makes you do SQL but better. Um, one of the ways that it does this is it uses Jinja templating, um, which allows you to use Python functions and um, write queries in a templated form using this Jinja templated form and then turn that into executable SQL. I, like, I, I won't say that I fully understand all of the ins and outs of how that works. That's very much more on the data engineering side of it. But the thing that Jinja templating allows you to do is it allows you to handle dependency management. And that, for me as an analyst, is huge. So what I mean by that is if you've ever been in the situation where you wrote a query um, and it's based off of some source of data and then something changed in that data source, but you're not aware of that, it like failed silently. Um, and then you wrote that query, you find out that hmm, this, this doesn't output the way I expect it anymore. And it's because something changed, but you were not aware of that. What DBT allows you to do is handle that dependency management and make sure that things fail loudly. So in the example that I have right here, if something changed, you can see that this final customer's table is dependent on a staging customer's table, which is dependent on the raw data coming out of the data lake. If something changed in that raw data in the data lake, um, DBT would tell me, hey, something has changed in your data. And it would probably throw you an error. And when I go to look at my customer's table, I know um, that something has changed. So it, like, it really helps you maintain the data, data integrity. And if something has changed um, upstream, and make sure to run that thing upstream and then let everything that is downstream of it um, kind of fall into place. So you manage all of the different dependencies for all these things. And this dependency graph, this is a very simple one. It can get extremely complicated once you start like really building out your lake house. Um, the other big thing is uh, it allows for um, macros and configurable tests using a YAML file. So that's just like another markdown I think the YAML actually stands for yet another markdown file. Um, but basically, you can add markdown to your SQL with a bunch of information about what is in your query. So this is like, uh, this is commenting on steroids. But the, the big piece here is that you can create tests on your queries, where if the tests fail, um, you know right away, like there's something wrong with your query or there's something wrong with the underlying data. Go check this. Um, so yeah, it really, really helps you understand what is happening in um, your queries, and it also uh, helps you know, like maintain the integrity of your data and all of your reports downstream. Um, and I will go into this because I'm going to be showing you um, a big example for all of this. But the last piece is it also gives you these really great, um, it gives you great, great documentation out of the box. Um, this is like a small snapshot of it. I will actually walk you through um, a piece of documentation that uh, we have with the example that I'll show. So before I start talking about DBT um, by itself, I also want to talk about dimensional modeling. Uh, shout out to Ralph Kimball. Um, if you have worked in databases or in SQL, this should be something that's like somewhat familiar, but it's not totally okay. This is actually something that I also only really learned in the last couple of years. But dimensional, mo dimensional modeling is a structure for how you manage your um, tables within um, a database. And the lake house, which is where the transformation is happening of your data from a data lake, the power of the lake house really comes with how you structure your data. So if you follow um, a certain format for that, um, you can get some really powerful insights out of your data very quickly. Um, and that you can do through dimensional modeling. So, in the dimen in dimensional modeling, there's a bunch of different types of tables that 
um, have different definitions of how they should look. And those are these tables here. And I'll talk about those in a second. But before that, um, in DBT, I want to talk about how you get from data in your data lake into your lake house. So backing up a bit, data in your data lake, it's unstructured. And it can come from multiple different sources. So what you want to do um, and what DBT um, suggests that you do is you build a staging table first, which is basically a as is um, copy of the data in your source file. And what this allows you do, to do is it reduces the number of reads that you have to make um, from your source system, um, it, which is like super computationally expensive. It makes things kind of speed up. And once you have have this data in your staging table, now you can really um, transform it into whatever way you want. And so when you transform it, depending on what data is inside of um, your staging table, you can define what type of table you want to create. So if you wanted to create a dimension table, that would be a very, very wide table with a whole bunch of attributes about an entity. So if you're thinking about customers, it'd be like everything that you want to know about a customer, you would have a customer, each, each um, unique row would be a customer, and then you have this massive wide table. So anytime you have that type of data, you want to create a dimension table. Anytime you have um, information where it is measurement of an event, so like transactions, for example, those are facts. So you want to create a fact table and you want to end up with a really, really long table that has all of your measurements of an event. Um, some other ones that are um, slightly more complicated is our bridge table. That's Those are tables where you have many attributes um, of one entity and many attributes of another entity, and you want to combine those together, that's called a bridge table. And so if I'm ever looking at um, a table and it has like BR or bridge um, in front of it, I will know, oh, this is a bridge table. This is comparing a many, many, many to many relationship between two entities, which is where this becomes useful. The last one I'll talk about is a slowly changing dimension. So this is like a very wide and a very long table. This is basically a dimension table, but with historical records about an entity. Um, SCDs are really, really powerful. We actually, most of the lake house that um, Arcadia uses, we have, it's just full of SCDs. Um, but they're kind of complicated. Uh, but the, the point of all this being, Defining what type of table you are creating right before you do that transformation of the data is really powerful and it really helps people downstream understand what type of data they're looking at. So let's go through an example. Let's go through an example of um, building a system with DBT. And at this point, I don't know if you're fully convinced with why this is this is useful. It really just seems like, oh, okay, do some SQL, um, but in like a slightly different way. And that's true, but I hope by the end of this example, it like I can really show the power. Um, so here are two really simple raw uh, pieces of data, two tables that exist in a database. The database is called EP Public. Um, that's just like an internal database that we have at Arcadia. And all it has is, zip code information. So the zip code table has an ID for every zip code. It has a state ID, um, and then it has a city. The states table, it has an ID, a state ID, um, a name, and an abbreviation associated with the name. This is a super simple example, um, but I think it still shows the, the point. So the thing, the issue with the zip codes table in um, its raw form is it only has state ID, and I want to be able to know, as an analyst, I want to know what state the state ID is. State ID 47 doesn't actually mean anything to me. I want to know what state that is. So you're probably thinking, like, okay, that seems like a really simple query. You just, like, select all from zip codes. You join in the state ID to ID, and then you'll have um, all the states associated with your zip codes, which is correct. That is exactly what we're going to do, but we're going to do it, like, in a slightly more fancy way. So the desired output is we want a dimension table, as I explained before, because for every entity, we want all of the information about it. Um, and we want to know, we want an entity table for, or sorry, we want a dimension table for zip codes. But we want the dimension table for zip codes to be dependent on your, your um, 
raw zip codes table loaded into your lake house as a staging table and then pulled into your final transform table of a dimension table. But you also want the state information. So you also need to take your raw state information, pull it into your lake house as a staging table, and then turn that into a dimension table that you can then use um, and combine with your zip codes to create your zip code dimension. This is our desired output. So how do we do this? Well, first we wanna create a staging table um, for states. So like I said before, the point of a staging table is you want that data that is in that like kind of unstructured place um, in, the, uh, in the data lake to be pulled into the lake house as an exact copy, and then we can transform that data. So pulling that in as a copy, um, the state table, we are just defining it exactly as it is. And it, it is just a SQL query where I'm saying, the ID from this table, I want to call it state ID. I call it EP state ID in this case because the raw data is called EP. So just to like know what that raw source is. Um, the name, I'm going to redefine it as a state name. So it's like super clear to the analyst. Um, abbreviation, I'm going to call it state abbreviation, super clear to the analyst. And then I am saying from a slightly different thing. So this is where the Jinja templating is. And source is a function that is in Python that DBT uses to pull from the source EP public, that's the database, and the table states. Um, and what, so right here, this is like almost SQL. It's not fully SQL. When you run this, it becomes compiled SQL and it actually builds this staging table. So to run this, you just run the, you just run the command in your console, dbt run, select and the name of your table. And then what DBT does is it compiles and builds this table and tells you, look, it, this, this worked, this met all of our um, basic expectations for a query, completed successfully. And then if you go to query this table, you'll see, look, I, I created, I wrote a SQL query, I created a table, fantastic. Super simple. So the next piece is, okay, so I created the staging table and now I wanna take that staging table and I wanted to actually make it a dimension. Um, this example is kind of silly because I don't do anything with it. I don't do anything different from the staging um, state to the, uh, the dimension state. It just, I now have a dimension table called states. Uh, it looks exactly like my staging table. I'm referencing um, the staging table to build this. I run my SQL query, or sorry, I run my DBT. Does it work correctly? Yes, it does. It was completed successfully. And now I can query my DM states. So why is that interesting? That was like, oh, that wasn't super exciting. Um, but what you can do now in DBT is you can add a YAML file to that query. So this is what a YAML file looks like, just using Markdown. Um, and this is saying that for my model, it's named DM states. This model, uh, it, is, it gives you information about states in the US and it has three columns. So you have your EP state ID, your state name and your state abbreviation. And for each column, it gives you a description. Um, and then within each of these columns, there is a test. So the test that I want to ensure for this table is that every state ID is not null, that null is not an option and that it is unique. Same with the state name. I want to make sure that's not null and it's unique and same with the abbreviation. Um, I don't want any dupes and I want them to not be null. And if anything enters this table that is a, is a duplicate, like if there's two Maryland's, for example, um, this test will fail and DBT will be, will tell me when I run DBT test, it'll tell me, hey, look, there's, there's something wrong. This test failed. Um, there is something wrong with uh, the state of, your table. So that's that's super powerful. And this is like a little bit of a silly example, but you can imagine for like really large tables why that might become uh, very useful. DBT does have a lot of tests out of the box. Uh, if you go, I, I literally copy and pasted this from the DBT docs. Um, it has four tests out of the box. It has unique, uh, not null, accepted values, which I think is super interesting, and relationships. And these are just tests that you can pull in directly and put in any of your YAML files and it will apply to your model. 
Um, you also have the option to customize tests and make your own tests and then save them as a macro and then pull them in to your YAML files to apply to any of the models or the tables that you build. Um, the accepted values test is one I use a lot. It tells you these are the only values that are allowed to um, show up for the status field in this particular example. And if any other um, value shows up, dbt will flag to you, hey, something has changed in your data, go check it out. So that's super useful. Going back to our example, um, again, so our desired output, we wanna get this DM zip codes table, right? So we've built, we pulled in um, our state raw data, we created our staging table, we created our dimension table, and now we're there. Now we need to pull in the base zip code information make it a staging table, and then finally combine these two to create our zip code dimension table. So again, this is what the data looks like. This is what the raw zip code data looks like. So again, I'm going to write my staging table um, where I take the ID, I name it something super clear, the zip code ID, the relationship. Um, it's going to be the same name as uh, the state. And the values, I do a little bit of cleaning to make sure that my zip codes make sense. Um, and I also give the all the fields types. Another thing that we do um, at Arcadia, and I will probably carry forever, is whenever we write SQL, we make sure that we order our um, fields in a certain way. So we always put all of our identities first, all of our fields that are relationships to other um, tables, that goes next, all of the fields that are values, we combine those together. And then at the bottom, um, anything that's like a timestamp, we usually um, group those together as well. And so the nice thing is anyone else on your team can go look at your queries and be like, know exactly what they're looking at, like what type of field that is and where it exists. So it's just like a small aside. Um, again, it is pulling from the source EP public, it's pulling from the table zip codes. I run um, my, dbt run command to see to build this table and yes it completed successfully uh i can query this now i now have a staging table and now i want to turn this into a dimension table i uh have my zip code um table i'm pulling in from the staging zip codes, but this is slightly more interesting now because I actually want to pull in the state information. So I'm doing this join here where I join the states um, with the state IDs onto the zip codes table and I save it. I do dbt run again. I see, does this work? Yes, it works. Great, I've created this table. Now I wanna make sure that this table e exists and it has all of the um, fields, all, all the fields maintain their integrity. And so I can build a test. Um, and I do that within my YAML file. So in this case, same thing, created my YAML file with all my descriptions, um, defined all my tests. And then I did dbt run, but in this case, I um, dbt fails. I've done something wrong, oh no. Um, if I was braver, I would do a live demo, but I was not, so <laughs> we're going with screenshots. Um, so if you can see here, it was, it failed on the unique, um, test in DM zip codes for EP state ID. And the reason it failed, it tells you down here, it says it got 51 results. This test got 51 results, but it was configured to fail if it was equal, greater than or equal to zero. And so if I go look over here, I see, ah, yes, on the zip codes table, I don't want to have uniqueness as a constraint because there will be multiple state the multiple duplicates of states because there's obviously multiples of codes in one state. So I'm like, oh, I don't want this test here. I just put this in here so you can see this is what it looks like when it fails. So if I take all that stuff out, run it again, it's like, oh, look, it's fine. I don't actually want that um, there. But had this been a situation where I did have that uniqueness constraint and something had changed about my data and it was no longer unique, you would get an error just like this. And that's an example of how that shows up. So we've done it, we've used dbt, we now have this table um, and it tells us for our zip code, what is the name of the state? And now it exists in our lake house. If any other analyst ever wants to know what the state associated with a zip code is, they can just pull from this DM zip codes table. They will never have to like actually write the SQL again because it just like exists as a table. 
Um, and the really nice part here is the final um, output, the documentation that's associated with it. So this is what the DBT docs look like. This is the DMs of code table is actually a table that we have um, at Arcadia. And here it shows you, the documentation tells you exactly what the description is. And this is pulling directly from the YAML file. It tells you what columns there are, what the description of the columns um, are, what the types are, what it's referenced by, what tests it uses, what models depend on it. In this case, the, the term models in DBT um, means tables, which can be a little confusing if you're a predictive modeler. Um, but yeah, and then it'll actually show you the source um, SQL and then the compiled SQL, which is great. So ever since we adopted this lake house um, world and we started using DBT, uh, our ability to build um, and expand our team has just just gotten so much faster um, because anything that anybody else builds, it just like shows up in our uh, DBT docs. And so you can just go look up any um, information you want um, about our lake house. And you can see here, we have so many of them. How am I doing on time? I think, okay. Um, so, the all of this talk, I, I titled this talk, You Are an Analytics Engineer, and I did that on purpose because this does sort of come back to ARM. Um, so going back to the original problem statement, I told my marketing team that I could build a tool that would predict the likelihood of a customer staying given that they convert based off of a bunch of features. So I wanted to take, so basically I'm, I'm building the machine uh, learning workflow. And I want to take the machine learning workflow and I want to take all of the things I've learned about DBT and I want to put them together so you can get all of the optimizations um, and the data integrity and the documentation from DBT and apply it to your ML workflow. So in this case, the, um, the model is taking in a bunch of demo, psychographic, geo data, I'm taking in survival data of past and current customers and combining them together. I'm using the RMS survival survive minor um, packages in R to do some survival analysis. And my model then outputs the probability of survival at a selected time period. So 30 days, 90 days, what, what have you. Um, and so then I will be able to tell you this customer with these demographics, demographic, geographic features um, is whatever percent likely to stay uh, a customer at 30 days based off of um, past customers with similar um, information. Now, you can really unlock the power of your ML workflow if you apply the DBT structure to it. So in structuring your data, the first piece um, information that you want is your observations model. So you want to have a dimension table that is in your lake house that contains exactly one record per every observation that you want to make a prediction on. So it would look something like this. So I have two customers. This is all the information. From there, you create, you do all the modeling in R, and then the output is your predictions model. And so this is going to be a fact table where it collects facts or every new prediction you have about any um, observation, or sorry, every record, um, every new prediction you have for every customer, um, it will show up as an observation in this model. So for example, uh, for prediction one, for customer one, the first prediction on 10.1 is one year. For customer one, again, the second prediction that you have on 10.2 is 1.5 years, and then customer two. And so it's just like a very long table of facts. And then the final table that you have, the production model, or in this case, table, uh, is also a fact table where you get one record per observation for the latest prediction joined in. And then all the downstream exports and reports and everything point back to this model, to this table. Um, and therefore, whenever you're giving your stakeholder any information and any um, exports you build off of that, it's always based off of the latest version of your model. And so another way to visualize this is if in your lake house, you have your observations model, do your analysis in R, you throw it back into your predictions model. And again, model and DBT means table. 
uh, and then you store that into your production model and then everything exports from there. And just like I showed you before, all of that great stuff, all that documentation and all of those tests and everything um, can be applied to all of these uh, different tables so that you maintain the most um, data integrity that you want. So that was a lot. I hope you learned something. I hope you understand what DBT means now. Um, this is all stuff that I learned in like calendar year 2022. Um, and really the way that I learned it is just through a community of practice. And the community of practice for me just happened to be my job itself. Um, and it, the entire data analytics team at Arcadia this year basically became analytics engineers. We all discovered this is something that we really need to do. We need to get all of our data in the data lake and into the lake house so we can have all of our business definitions. Um, and so it, it really has been kind of a team sport um, and it has been incredibly, incredibly helpful to have data engineers just like by your side for every step of the way because the stuff is super complicated. Um, so yeah, through all of that, I, I sort of learned how to be an analytics engineer. A um, couple of shout outs, got a shout out Max Richmond. Uh, he gave the the condensed version of this talk with me at the uh, our Gov conf uh, conference two weeks ago, Sam Swift, it's actually a New York native. Um, he is our VP of data systems and he's actually the guy that brought all of this knowledge to Arcadia and like has really taught me so much of this. So if you know him, he's great. Uh, if you don't know him, like he's a good good person to know. Uh, Ni uh, was a teammate on my team who uh, actually did all of that survival analysis that I was talking about. So gotta shout her out. Uh, and of course, thank you to uh, Arcadia State Engineering Team and the Analytics Team. And of course, thank you, Lander Analytics and Jared for welcoming me back to speak yet again. And I am ready for your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we're a pleasure to have you speak always. You've spoken at a couple of our conferences, our meetup now, and we'll hopefully have you again. Yeah, I would love to speak again. <laughs> nice. Uh, I do see a few people just saying thank you. It was great. It's a little golf clap. Uh, for Dania. Um, so a few questions we'll go through. Uh, so first of all, we did confirm the EBT stands for data build tool. Aha, great. Um, Amada, who used to work for us, uh -huh. in, uh, you saw with a meetup, she works for DBT now. Yes. So she's very excited to answer that. Thank you, Amada. <laughs> um, so if, uh, we have, there's a bunch of questions. So first of all, you said it's built in Python, but it seems like it's all SQL. So you don't, do you need to write Python code? To write this so it's all SQL. I think, I think if you're the data engineer implementing it, you need to do some of the Python um, as the analyst or the analytics engineer. Uh, not so much. It's really just like writing that SQL um, okay. in that structured way. So, how is a data lake? There's a two part question. How's a data lake that different from like a very extensive data warehouse? And how's a lake house different than views in a database? Because a view pre computes things for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is a great question that a data engineer would be more suited to answer than myself. Uh, I, I might I might punt. Um, I think there are probably many different ways of being able to do that. And I think views are one one big way of that. I think the the big piece with the lake house is being able to use the um the tool, the additional tool that DBT gives you and implementing that within your lake house, I think that's where that true power lies that you don't necessarily get with views. The visual tool you said? The, like, I mean, the, like the visualization plus like the documentation plus the, the YAML files and the tests and like all of that stuff. If you implement all of that within your lake house, uh, that I think is unlocks additional power. Okay. So it's all like the nice tools that go around it. Yeah. Okay. Um, then the lake house, is it duplicating? Since you say you make copies, like staging copies of the stuff in the in the lake, is that just duplicating the data? So now you have like two, duplicate or triplicate copies of your data set? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. So, it, and the reason for that is, again, it's a more of a data engineering thing. It has something to do with maintaining, like, you don't want to touch, you don't want to keep pinging the, the data lake for the information um every time you try and transform it because that will be very computationally expensive so yeah you do want to keep a copy of it um somewhere there's also there's another specific reason that has to do with the uh, jinja templating and how um it's dbt is able to do the 
um, dependency management, which is why that staging table is really important. But I don't know if I could speak to like the full full reason why. All right. So it sounds like we are making like, multiple copies of data, yeah. which sort of goes back to um, the old way of doing things where analysts just got a read only copy of the database. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the data, the lake house, is it itself a database or is it a file system? Like it's what is, is it built on Postgres or something? Uh, it's, for us, yeah, it's built in Snowflake. Yep, it is. It is a database. Um, okay. And it's core. But All the right. difference is it's come. It's the difference between a database, a data lake, and the lake house is the lake house is a database of structured data that comes from your data lake, which is a whole bunch of unstructured data from a whole bunch of different data sources and structures. So okay. data lake is a database of databases. The lake house is a database. <laughs> That pulls on a data warehouse was back in the day a database of databases. Yeah, so it's, all it's, just like, it's yeah. like it's all the same stuff. You kind of do it. Yeah, and, and I, I think a lot of the stuff is also very buzzwordy right now. Like I'm sure there are other terms for it that have existed for much, much longer, and these are just the ones people use now. A, a lot of what I'm getting from not from your talk, but from general about the modern data stack is just SQL with variables. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. It's like stuff we were doing 20 years ago. We just calling it completely different things and it's easier yeah. to use them. Yeah. Well, I was reading like Ralph Kimball's book and I was like, this is like, this came out in the eighties. Like you guys have been thinking about this for so long. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just now learning about it and it's just hot now. Yeah. Yes. I think it's a good way to put it. Um, it's hot now. It's like, I've been, I've been trying to follow the, you know, uh, since partly your talk from the conference. And now a lot of it seems like, you know, reinvent, not reinventing, just taking what was made in the nineties and making it easier. Yep. Um, and there's a question, are you using DBT core or DBT cloud? Um, I, that's a good question that I don't actually, I think we're using DBT cloud. Okay, so then that brings up the follow-up question. Are you aware of the pricing changes they made today and the new restrictions they made? <laughs> so full disclosure, I discovered that right at the beginning of this, <laughs> this meeting. Uh, yeah, kind of sucks, but I guess that's good for them because uh, clearly their product is, is useful and people are willing to pay. Yep. Um, okay. So then, um, so the YAML tests, again, this is going to be the one of the more questions. Is this different than like constraints in a database table? Yeah. Um, so sort of like mm -hmm. it is, it's essentially what that is. I think, I think the, the YAML test, the ability to build these like custom macros uh, that test unique things that you or I don't want to say unique, but test uh, things very specific to your data. I think that's where like that real power is. So the stuff, the like, custom stuff that comes out of the box, that's that's great. Uh, but what we have really gotten the power from is being able to build these custom tests that is very specific to our data. Okay. Yeah. But then the test, if let's say one row fails on a test, does the whole thing fail or can you still use all the other rows that didn't fail? <laughs> this has been a big issue. So as we've implemented DBT and we've like learned this, um, we've had to learn about, we've had to kind of restructure it to like being a hard fail to warnings because yeah, there are, there have been times where something, something super upstream will fail and everything, like the whole thing shuts down. It's like, oh, what, what failed? And so this is the give and take, right? On the one hand, it's like, I know exactly, I know my data is like perfect to a T at any given moment, but also it like, it might not be working at any given moment because everything is always failing. Um, so having a good team of data engineers to monitor that, um, they, we have an actual person with the title of analytics engineer and her job is to really monitor um, that and maintain that. that. That is a pretty big piece of it. Um, but yeah, there are ways to um, set it up so it doesn't completely shut down your entire system and you're just aware that, okay, you might not have 100% quality. And speaking of being aware, like, do you get alerted by email or Slack or carrier yeah, pigeon? Yeah, we, uh, we have a Slack integration. Um, we have just like the, I think it's like Feed Lake House is the Slack channel. And every time there's a run every hour, tells you, did it fail? Did it succeed? If it failed, these are the tests that failed. This is the model. This is the actual like query that failed and then it, you can go fix it. Is there like a health dashboard telling you how the system is going? We we have, I don't know, there's one out of the box from DBT, but what we have done is we've built one um, that we have in Hex um, that we use internally. So yeah, yeah. you're really deep in the modern day stack. I know Hex is another big one. Right I know. Now. <laughs> you want me to come back and talk about Hex? That's that's my next talk. <laughs> that's I think one. we would like that. Uh, I know another speaker from the conference, Sarah, um, she was one of the investors in Hex and she's really super excited about it and she's yeah, super excited about DBT. Great. So yeah. yeah, 
I, I really want them to build out their like R bit in Hex. Like it's still uh, in beta, but oh man, the power that's going to unlock. I had a conversation with the Hex people back in 2020 when they're, yeah. when they're actually looking to be invested in, we're looking for investors and they show me everything in Python. I'm like, that's really cool. Can we do something in R? Um, so hopefully, hopefully they'll come around to that. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice product. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're ready to do your analysis, your survival modeling. Getting the data out of DBT just sounds like you use DBI, treat it like any other database and just do a, a select or something like that. Yep. Oh, actually, before I actually do this question, the data, um, since if, to me, it feels like a view, is it more of a materialized view? Like when you query from R to get the data from the database, is it running calculations right then or is everything pre-computed as a materialized view? I think, or similar it, to me, so. I think it is the latter. Okay. I think it's saved that way. That's a good question. I don't, this is where I see, this is when I was a manager of the team and not actually doing that. Okay. <laughs> so like, we need me in the room to tell you the answer. Fair. Fair. I know like, it's like, I know with views, I know these, these to me, it feels like views. That's what I'm asking. With yeah. a regular view, every time you say select all from view, it has to compute the view. Yeah. But with a materialized view, it's, it's already computed and stored. Yeah, yeah. And so, and it's it's much faster when you do it this way, which makes me think that it is the latter, but someone should check me on that. So you got your data out of DBT into R, treating like just like a regular database at this point. Yeah, that's yeah, all this. You, you fit your fancy survival model, mm -hmm. right? So then how do you use that model? Like a new row of data, a new customer comes in, you want to score them. How do you use that model in this whole process? Yeah. So um, the so the output. So this is kind of the the power of R compared with like with the power of DBT. Like being able to output R, um, the predicted values. Like output, you can even output that as a CSV and then like load it into your lake and you know put it into your lake house. Like as soon as that happens, as soon as you get more information, then like you need your R. Uh, you need the the model to run again. So. That that was also the other thing that we needed to do was like create um, the word is escaping me right now. We basically create a schedule for every time we get new data, the thing runs again. It runs periodically. It updates the values. It goes back into your like your prediction output model that goes into your production model, and then that model gets pulled away. Let's break that down. So a, how do you call the R the R model to score every so often? Like, is it a cron job or is that a yeah. DBT thing? That That's the word. Yeah, yeah, right. cron job. Yes. <laughs> so you generate, you have five new records or whatever it is that are scored. How do you get that back into your yeah. DBT models? Yeah. Or so the, the way we were doing it is we were outputting that as um, a CSV and then it was just getting like ingested back into the lake. All right. Um, and then I asked on some things. I think um, Edgar, um, he's one of our, he spoke at MYR this year. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote a package called Tidy Predict. I think this Tidy Predict does, which translates some R models, maybe not survival models, probably, but some R models into SQL code. Ooh, is there... I didn't know. Oh, that. I guess I... <laughs> All right, so my question is going to be: Is there a way to incorporate that into DBT? Yeah, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's like a, a even better way. If the, like if I could skip the step where I turn it into a CSV and just ingest it right back into the lake and then right back into the lake house, like that would be huge. I haven't quite figured that part out yet. Tidy predict, check it out. It's part of the tidy models team. So I'm gonna write that down. Cool. Hey, glad I can contribute. Yeah. I always um, learn. that's the point of this meetup, right? Always <laughs> learning more. <laughs> that's great. Okay. So I think I went through all the questions we got from the meetup and from the from the Slack and from the Zoom. Let me just check. If there's any last questions, folks, now is your last chance to sneak one in before the closing wire. Um and let me know if you have any questions. We'll give, we'll stall for a few moments to see if people have questions. Um, and if nothing comes in, I will, I'll make some announcements or I guess, um, I'll just recap the announcements we made earlier uh, while we see if there's any last tables. Yeah, any last questions, I mean. All right, so folks, jobs, post them in the job postings channel of NY Hack R. Uh, pizza, I hope you all eat some good food. The January meetup is January 24th with Epec and Sari talking about um, analyzing patient-generated mobile health data. And the um, our Gov videos will be up in the next two weeks or so. So I hope to see everyone both virtually or in person in um, January at the next meetup. So with that, 
Let's give a book. That, that's the thing. It's everything. Um, I had a great time learning about DBT. I had personally had a lot of questions and wondering what DBT does. So I got a lot of clarity out of this. So I want to personally thank you for really um, educating me. Then I want to say thank you on behalf of the little meetup. I hope everyone had a great time learning. I hope everyone watching this on YouTube later has a great opportunity to learn from you. And I uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, making this happen. Golf clap, everybody, for our wonderful speaker. Thanks so much, Jared. Thank you. So you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for being here with us, especially everyone. Also, she did this on such short notice. Like two <laughs> weeks ago, we asked her. Like she came off the stage at our gov and said, can you give another talk? And she said yes. And it was really, really awesome that she did this. So I want to thank you for the short notice. Um, and if anyone wants to give a talk, either in person or virtual, send me a message. Send Nicole a message. Tweet at us. Find us on Slack. Find us on LinkedIn. Email us. Do whatever you need to do to get in track of us and in touch of us because we would love to have um, more speakers lined up in advance. Sometimes we're finding people two weeks out. Sometimes we're finding people six months out. So, you know, it's nice when we have six months out. It makes things a little less stressful. Um, so everyone have a great night. Thank you for attending and see everyone soon. Bye everybody.